That was uh, absolutely marvelous. And I want to welcome all of you to the 27th Annual Presidential Lecture. First, uh, join me once again in thanking our Matisse Trio for that beautiful musical prelude. You've uh, absolutely set the tone for an engaging and inspiring lecture, and it's especially wonderful to see the talents of our School of Music faculty this year. You know, uh, you show us that despite the challenges that the school continues to face due to the flood of 2008, you remain dedicated to developing your extraordinary talents and sharing them generously with your students, and most especially today, with our community. So again, you are an inspiration to us all. I want to thank you genuinely from me, from the bottom of my heart, for what you are doing to make this a wonderful campus. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks. I trust everyone knows that we are on the path to a new school of music, which is good news, obviously, for all of us and certainly for these wonderful faculty. President James O. Friedman established the Presidential Lecture Series over a quarter century ago. This event not only showcases some of our many outstanding faculty members, but it also serves to encourage communication across disciplinary boundaries. As well, the lecture brings the tremendous work of our faculty scholars to the general public. For 27 years, through this forum, we have proudly shared our excellence in areas ranging from mathematics, to physics and astronomy, to the health sciences, to music, to law. And I'm very, very pleased today, on this beautiful sunny Valentine's Day, to introduce to you our 27th presidential lecturer, Marilyn Robinson, David J. Scorton, F. Wendell Miller, Professor of Creative Writing. There are only a handful of faculty members at any institution whose names would be widely recognized by much of the general public. And here at the University of Iowa, we're very, very honored that Marilyn Robinson, world-renowned author, is one of those talented people whose work and influence extend so broadly across the globe. Another globally recognized name is the Iowa Writers' Workshop, the first and still the best creative writing program in the world. If you play word association with someone, Perhaps the most common response when you say University of Iowa, anywhere in the world, would be the Writer's Workshop. The workshop has maintained that status and reputation for many decades. For some time now, much of that reputation is thanks to Mar Marilyn Robinson being on our faculty. In 2008, our local community earned one of the greatest honors, being designated UNESCO's City of Literature and the first in the Western Hemisphere. The remarkable literary talent and dedication to the written word that abounds here made this honor a natural one for the Iowa City community. But the foundation of such a designation is the Writer's Workshop, and the workshop's star is so bright thanks to the enormous talent of the likes of Marilyn Robinson. Your program lists many of Marilyn's accomplishments and publications in her biography. So I won't repeat all of those. But it's clear we have something special with an author who has won a Pulitzer Prize, a National Book Critics Circle Award, an Orange Prize, and numerous other major awards. But that accounting of publications and awards can't truly capture the, the character of this superb author as a person, as a colleague, and maybe most especially as a teacher. So let me share with you just a few more insights. One of Marilyn Robinson's greatest honors was being selected by the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1998 to receive a Strauss Living Award. This five-year stipend totals a quarter of a million dollars, and it's intended to enable writers to focus entirely on their work without requiring other employment. The University of Iowa's regard for Marilyn is so great that we responded in a way that most universities would not we granted her a five-year leave of absence. But Marilyn quickly, <laughs> Sam's laughing, quickly realized that teaching had become a very central part of her life. In fact, it, be, it had become so much so that after only 18 months on leave, she turned down the remainder of the stipend to return teaching, 
to teaching in the workshop. Now, to me, as a university president, this is a very, very inspiring story. And that action over a decade ago was not just a fluke. Marilyn, to this day, sees herself as a teacher as much as a writer. In fact, if you go to a page featuring her on the UI admissions website, her quotation there very simply is, I love teaching. No one can tell you more about what an amazing writer, teacher, and inspiration Marilyn Robinson is than her students and her colleagues. In fact, our current director of the Writer's Workshop, Lan Samantha Chang, is both a former student and a current colleague. So on this special occasion, I'm delighted to share with you a few words that Sam Chang has shared with me about Marilyn Robinson. This is a quote. As a student, I used to sit in Marilyn's class making lists of the words she used that most people don't ordinarily use in daily speech. <laughs> words such as chastened. And she once said, a story is a pearl of mutually referring meditations. We are absolutely thrilled to have Marilyn here among us, and she is a deeply generous as well as brilliant writer. Sam's words. Generous and brilliant. I can think of fewer better adjectives to describe this amazing writing, writer, teacher, and university communi community member. And I know she'll, she will demonstrate both of those qualities in her talk with us today. I'm very, very honored to introduce to you this year's presidential lecturer, Please help me welcome Marilyn Robinson. Well, thank you for an extremely generous, almost terrifying introduction. <laughs> It is a great honor to be here, um, and I'm it's lovely of you all to come in out of the beautiful weather. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, um, I've written some remarks, and then after that I'm going to read some passages from uh, Gilead that basically um, have to do with what I was thinking about in association with these other issues that I'm talking about first. I came here to Iowa City because I was invited to be a visiting professor in the, in the writer's workshop. I stayed because I learned to love the place. More than 20 years have passed since I arrived here, very fruitful years for me, in part because the customs and culture of the workshop, the university, and the town encourage and support the kind of life writing requires. But more than that, being here, that is, in the Middle West, has made me rethink the history and mindset of American civilization. I discovered here the persistence of an old dream, and much more than a dream, a future that arrived too early to have been sustained, though it left behind customs and values and attitudes that have characterized the Middle West ever since. I've spoken and written about the abolitionist movement in this region and the educational and reformist movements associated with it, all of which anticipated a future of which the country was not yet capable. As a historical phenomenon, this amazed me. It gave the landscape a new quality, bathed it in a new light, when I began to realize what it had seen of rigor and passion and idealism. And it made me understand how transient even the memory of selfless and patient effort, not to say its practical effects, can be even in the course of two or three generations. Having discovered that this loss of the future had happened once, I began to see recurrences of the pattern here and in the country as a whole. So the Middle West has become for me a full-fledged fascination. It is extraordinary how confidently people generalize about this enormous, various region. Its boundaries are subject to debate, but by the Census Bureau's reckoning, they contain more than 66 million souls. That is, in terms of population, the Middle West is smaller than Germany, but larger than Britain or France. To give a sense of its physical scale in European terms, Germany is a little smaller than Montana, France is four-fifths the size of Texas. 
So the great swatch of terrain that stretches from the border of Pennsylvania through Nebraska and from the border of Canada through Missouri would be a vast country in its own right. Nevertheless, to quote the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Middle West has become more an idea than a region, <clears throat> an area of immense diversity, but somehow consciously representative of a national average. This is remarkable because its diversity is indeed immense. Its population reflects tides of immigration as surely as any other part of the country, including the great internal migration of African Americans after the Civil War. It is as intensely industrial as it is intensely agricultural. It is politically polarized. That out of all this could come an average surely should seem questionable. As the Britannica says, the term does express an idea, one that has real and regrettable consequences for the region. The word average is rarely a compliment. When my novel Home was published in France, it received a generous review in which the writer undertook to explain to his French readers what the Midwest is like. The following translation is mine. <clears throat> the writer said, the inhabitants of the American Midwest are isolated from urban civilization. <laughs> they distrust town people <laughs> and those who are too educated. <clears throat> whom they consider corrupted by mad atheist professors who, like Satan, have seduced the innocent spirits of American youth with sinful ideas. <laughs> the inhabitants of the Midwest have very fixed ideas about order, routine, and custom, about a notion of propriety they have modeled on what they believe to be the, the manners of European aristocrats, <laughs> ideas drawn from British novels of the 19th century. Their rituals are very precise. If dinner must be served at 5.30, it will be served at exactly 5.30, and this will be true every evening. <laughs> there is a good way to set the table, to greet someone at church or at the market, to dress, and if you do not respect these codes of conduct, you will be faulted and counted among the immoral. An action which deviates from the norm is not only inappropriate, but even a sin and a shame for the family of the sinner. <laughs> End of quote. Of course, there are more great cities in the Middle West than there are in France. <laughs> and many more great universities. But the writer is only typical in ignoring them, discounting any claim they might make to being an influence on the culture of the place or a reflection of it. When I say this sort of thing, I'm revealing the fact that I am not a Middle Westerner, at least, at least not truly and fully. Middle Westerners are modest people. They will feel a little embarrassment, perhaps take mild offense, at my mention of great cities and great universities, and especially my inviting them to compare themselves with France in a way that redounds to their own credit. But facts are facts. I have no reason to be reticent about the strengths of a culture neither I nor any relative or ancestor of mine had any part in building. Countries do have stereotyped notions about each other. The French imagine us as yokels, gangsters, and cowboys, and we imagine them as chefs, philosophers, and impressionists. But the thing I find striking about the particular review I have quoted is that it was not written by a Frenchman, but by an American a Californian presently residing in Texas. <laughs> he was describing in slightly exaggerated terms a vision of the Midwest found very commonly among our own coastal populations and even influential here, where evidence that it is misconceived should be extremely difficult to overlook. A British journalist who had come to investigate Iowa, by which he meant the writing program, looked down from my office window on the then still great Hancher Auditorium and said, Europeans know nothing about American civilization, absolutely nothing. This is not surprising since there are legions of Americans like my reviewer who are more than ready to misinform them, as they do in good faith being themselves persuaded that the vast interior of the country is an intellectual and cultural desert. Why does this matter? What importance does it have except as an instance of the fact 
that firmly held beliefs that run counter to reality are irritating in themselves, as well as an ominous reminder of the human penchant for massive and persistent error. Well, for one thing, if the Middle West is indeed thought of as the American average, which is really to say the American essence, then disparagement of the place proposes that mediocrity is the national norm. People can be strangely fond of this idea. It may be embraced as a painful truth because it has the little side benefit of allowing one to feel superior to one's neighbors. Still, it comes at a cost. It discourages awareness of the things around us that are to be valued and that create value. It encourages indifference toward our great cities with their histories of social and architectural innovation and their great cultural wealth. The region figures in national and world mythology as a backwater where certain traits, some admirable, some regrettable, persist because the influences of the coasts have, not, have so far failed to penetrate. It could be more accurately described as a forgotten American future where dreams of a new society were variously lived and institutionalized and where they still abide increasingly unrecognized for what they are. It seems to me <clears throat> that a crucial distinguishing feature of Middle Western culture is the vigor and excellence of its public institutions. One of the questions I am often asked when I travel is, why is Iowa in Iowa? <laughs> Perhaps the best answer would be that here it seemed possible for higher education to reinvent itself. The fine arts became important at Iowa, established as fields of graduate study much earlier than they did elsewhere. Iowa began um, awarding advanced degrees for creative theses in 1922. The workshop only really took its modern form about 75 years ago, but by then the principle was well established that an art can be encouraged and refined through graduate study. The receptivity of Iowa to the study of the arts reflects a view of society found in figures like Grant Wood and Lewis Sullivan, that beauty and quality should be features of common experience, of everyday life. Another British journalist asked me if writers who teach writers were not aware that they were training their own competitors. In fact, artists have trained younger artists since antiquity, and the late application of the model to the arts of fiction and poetry does not mean it deviates in principle from traditional practice. Still, the teaching of writing did emerge here first. From the beginning, distinguished authors taught so generously that the effectiveness of the Iowa program could not be ignored, and over time the workshop has created competitors for itself all over the United States, in Canada, and even in Europe. To put the matter in another light, <clears throat> there is a phenomenon abroad in the world that is owed in great degree to this classic instance of Iowan innovation. The workshop model has spread through schools and universities and far beyond them, to neighborhoods and hospitals and prisons. The reflection writing requires is a pure enhancement of many individual lives. Collaboration as a means of developing this notoriously solitary art may seem surprising, but the collaboration itself is full of interest and valuable to people whose work may never reach beyond that small circle of readers. There is no art that can be practiced so cheaply. Everyone has a reservoir of experience and reflection to draw on, and most people are competent to make an interesting use of language, given the effort. So the spirit that promoted the arts of music and theater and painting encouraged what may be the most democratic of all the arts, generalizing the experience of creation far beyond any limits that were traditionally assumed for it. It is not our custom these days to say that something good has happened, something has gone well. We never seem to consider that the workings of the law of unintended consequences might sometimes be benign, but I feel free to say these things because I am a relative latecomer. The workshop has been itself renowned and influential for a long, long time. Ambitious public schools and great public universities have characterized the Middle West since this broad frontier first became materially capable of creating its institutions. 
Earlier in these remarks, I proposed that rather than its being a survival of the American past, the region is the survival of an American future, one now increasingly forgotten and abandoned. There's a new book out called The Great American University by Jonathan Cole. It is an, impa an impassioned defense of universities as centers of research in their role as potent engines of scientific and technological advance against the increasing indifference or hostility of the society and the governments that have traditionally supported them. The economic value of these institutions is altogether beyond question. The need of our country to renew itself and to be capable of renewing itself again and again is not disputed. The research university is virtually unique as an American resource, and yet this most future-oriented, indeed future-creating resource is, according to Cole, in danger of being abandoned. If this is at risk, what is safe? A shift in priorities seems to have occurred in this country for which it would be difficult to offer a rational justification. A few years ago, when we thought we were very rich indeed, that we had perfected an economics that assured our wealth would only increase, there was pressure on the universities to bow to the wisdom of the market and, abandoning tenure, abandoning traditional disciplines, shape itself around the preferences of the student consumer. Now the wisdom of the market has shown itself to have been heavily compounded of chicanery and hot air, <laughs> and the student consumer is now the potential worker preparing to carry a burden of debt into a disheartening labor market. Everything changes, but the pressure on the university remains largely the same. For richer and for poorer, there seems to be an important, though unarticulated, national consensus that the university, if we have, as we have known it, is a luxury we are no longer willing to afford. This has the look of one of those recurrences I mentioned earlier, the turning away from the future. The new potency of the word elitist, which implies that there is something corrupting in the experience of education itself, that rather than enhancing life, it alienates from reality, that rather than enabling, it discredits, that in its nature it is the property of a social class who are distinct from and perhaps hostile to society at large, may be relevant here. Assumptions like these really are an ax at the root of the extraordinarily open and excellent system of education into which this country and this region have historically poured so much wealth and so much generous expectation. It is true that the modern culture of learning is clearly rooted in antiquity, in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, in the Enlightenment. It is unquestionably a product of the printing press. The continuous moving outward of access to knowledge so that broader populations could enjoy it and benefit from it is among the most significant phenomena in Western history. This university and so many others are its consequence and perhaps its culmination. This history can be read back to the time, not so distant, when education was indeed a mark of privilege, and its modern forms can be stigmatized on those grounds, if it is assumed that education is no more than a mark of privilege, without intrinsic work, worth, and of no interest to the non-elite. Why should some London Cockney ever want to read Homer? I am speaking, of course, of John Keats. The public university is based on the assumption that the narrowness of access to education that has prevailed historically is artificial and destructive. In this university, there was also the notion, important in that old American future, that in a public environment, the arts could flourish as well. And so they have done. How much wealth they have generated, it is impossible to know. How much value they have created and will create depends in considerable degree on what we choose to value. The young people who pass through here may be thought of as a workforce whose looming fear is unemployment and poverty and whose highest hope is to be serviceable in economic circumstances no one can foresee. Or they may be thought of as human spirits whose capacity for generosity and for creativity may well exceed anything we can imagine. They may be thought of as ready to make astonishing use of the best we can give them. 
That is the language of the old future, the one that sees beyond itself, our always fragile, always worthy heritage. That's that. <laughs> I'm going to be reading from Gilead, which is really the, it was in the course of writing this in a certain sense, the things that I was learning and, and observing about this region um, were taking form in my imagination, so to speak. And so they're kind of, rel it's, it's more relevant than home is to, to the remarks I just read. Um, <clears throat> for, for people who haven't read the book, it's a letter written in 1956 by an elderly pastor to his young son um, trying to describe his life, trying to make an account of his life, and in a certain sense, uh, by his writing, father of the child in a certain way, you know, in, as he cannot do, cannot anticipate doing because of his age and his health. Um, <clears throat> the, his name is John Ames. He is the descendant of abolitionists who came into the Middle West um, early and uh, established many, many of the important institutions, really. I mean, were very formative in terms of how this, how this uh, region developed. Um, he, uh, he's sort of, as, as the culture tended to be, frankly, forgetful. That was one of the things that's interesting to me about it. People both retain and forget um, heritage that they receive um, in many cases. That seemed very characteristic here, where, where many people, in fact, seem to be totally unaware that there was a reformist and an abolitionist early history, formative history uh, behind Iowa and Ohio and many other places. Um, the other part of the story is that this, the son of his best friend, his namesake, uh, Jack Bowden, returns to Gilead um, because he, um, he's very much in love with a woman, has a child with her, but cannot marry her because she's black. And in virtually every state in the Union, except Iowa, uh, there were laws against miscegenation, against interracial marriage. So, I mean, that was part of the old reformist heritage that nobody ever changed. And, you know, um, he, he's aware of it because it should mean something. It should give him peace, balm. Uh, but the world is the world. In any case, um, so I'm reading from Gilead. When I was 12 years old, my father took me to the grave of my grandfather. At that time, my family had been living in Gilead for about 10 years, my father serving the church here. His father, who was born in Maine and had come out to Kansas in the 1830s, lived with us for a number of years after his retirement. Then the old man ran off to become a sort of itinerant preacher, or so we believed. He died in Kansas and was buried there, near a town that had pretty well lost its people. A drought had driven most of them away, those who had not already left for towns closer to the railroad. Surely there was only a town in that place to begin with because it was Kansas, and the people who settled it were free soilers who weren't really thinking about the long term. I don't often use the expression godforsaken, but when I think back to that place, that word does come to mind. It took my father months to find where the old man had ended up, lots of letters of inquiry to churches and newspapers and so on. He put a great deal of effort into it. Finally, someone wrote back and sent a little package with his watch and a beat up old Bible and some letters, which I learned later were just a few of my father's letters of inquiry, no doubt given to the old man by people who thought they had induced him to come home. That was in 1892, so travel was still pretty hard. We went as far as, as we could by train, and then my father hired a wagon and team. That was more than we needed, but it was all we could find. We took some bad directions and got lost, and we had so much trouble keeping the horses watered that we boarded them at a, a farmstead and went the rest of the way on foot. The roads were terrible anyway, swamped in dust where they were traveled and baked into ruts where they were not. 
My father was carrying some tools in a gunny sack so he could try to put the grave to rice a little, and I was carrying what we had for food, hardtack and jerky, and the few little yellow apples we picked up along the road here and there, and our changes of shirts and socks, all by then filthy. He didn't really have enough money to make the trip at that time, but it was so much in his thoughts that he couldn't wait until he had saved up for it. I told him I had to go too, and he respected that, though it did make many things harder. My mother had been reading about how bad the drought was west of us, and she was not at all happy when he said he planned to take me along. He told her it would be educational, and it surely was. My father was set on finding that grave despite any hardship. Never before in my life had I wondered where I would come by my next drink of water, and I number it among my blessings that I have not had, to occasion, had occasion to wonder since. There were times when I truly believed we might just wander off and die. Once, when my father was gathering sticks for firewood into my arms, he said we were like Abraham and Isaac on the way to Mount Moriah. I thought as much myself. It was so bad out there we couldn't buy food. We stopped at a farmstead and asked the lady, and she took a little bundle down from a cupboard and showed us some coins and bills and said, it might as well be Confederate for all the good it does me. The general store had closed, and she couldn't get salt or sugar or flour. We traded some of our miserable jerky. I've never been able to stand the sight of it since then, for two boiled eggs and two boiled potatoes, which tasted wonderful even without salt. Then my father asked after his father, and she said, why, yes, he'd been in the neighborhood. She didn't know he had died, but she knew where he was likely to have been buried, and she showed us to what remained of a road that would take us right to the place, not three miles from where we stood. The road was overgrown, but as you walked along, you could see the ruts. The brush grew lower in them because the earth was still packed so hard. We walked past that graveyard twice, the two or three headstones in it had fallen over, and it was grown up with weeds and grass. The third time, my father noticed a fence post, so we walked over to it, and we could see a handful of graves, a row of maybe seven or eight, and below it a half row, swamped with that dead brown grass. I remember that the incompleteness of it seemed sad to me. In the second row, we found a marker someone had made by stripping a patch of bark off a log and then driving nails partway in and bending them down flat, so, made the, so they made the letters Rev Ames. The R looked like the A, and the S was a backward Z, but there was no mistaking it. It was evening by then, so we walked back to the lady's farm and washed at her cistern and drank from her well and slept in her hayloft. She brought us a supper of cornmeal mush, I loved that woman like a second mother. I loved her to the point of tears. We were up before daylight to milk and cut kindling and draw her a bucket of water, and she met us at the door with a breakfast of fried mush with blackberry preserves melted over it and a spoonful, and a spoonful of top milk on it, and we ate standing there at the stoop in the chill and the dark, and it was perfectly wonderful. Then we went back to the graveyard, which was just a patch of ground with a half-fallen fence around it and a gate on a chain weighted with a cowbell. My father and I fixed up the fence as best we could. He broke up the ground on the grave a little with his jackknife, but then he decided we should go back to the farmhouse again to borrow a couple of hoes and make a better job of it. He said, we might as well look after these other folks while we're here. This time, the lady had a dinner of navy beans waiting for us. I don't remember her name, which seems a pity. She had an index finger that was off at the first knuckle, and she spoke with a lisp. She seemed old to me at the time, but I think she was just a countrywoman, trying to keep her manners and her sanity, trying to keep alive, weary as could be, and all by herself out there. My father said she spoke as if her people might be from Maine, but he didn't ask her. She cried when we said goodbye to her and wiped her face with her apron. My father asked if there was a letter or a message she would like us to carry back with us, and she said no. He asked if she would like to come along, and she thanked us and shook her head and said, there's the cow. She said, we'll be just fine when the rain comes. <laughs> that graveyard was about the loneliest place you could imagine. 
If I were to say it was going back to nature, you might get the idea that there was some sort of vitality about the place. But it was parched and sun-stricken. It was hard to imagine the grass had ever been green. Everywhere you stepped, little grasshoppers would fly up by the score, making that snap they do like striking a match. My father put his hands in his pockets and looked around and shook his head. Then he started cutting the brush back with a hand scythe he had brought and we set up the markers that had fallen over. Most of the graves were just outlined with stones with no names or dates or anything on them at all. My father said to be careful where I stepped. There were small graves here and there that I hadn't noticed at first, or I hadn't quite realized what they were. I certainly didn't want to walk on them, but until he cut the weeds down, I couldn't tell where they were, and then I knew I had stepped on some of them, and I felt sick. Only in childhood have I felt guilt like that and pity. I still dream about it. My father always said when someone dies, the body is just a suit of old clothes the spirit doesn't want anymore. But there we were, half killing ourselves to find a grave and as cautious as we could be about where we put our feet. We worked a good while at putting things to rights. It was hot and there was such a sound of grasshoppers and the wind rattling that dry grass. Then we scattered seeds around, bee balm and coneflower and sunflower and bachelor's button and sweet pea. They were seeds we always saved out of our own garden. When we finished, my father sat down on the ground beside his father's grave. He stayed there for a good while, plucking at little whiskers of straw that still remained on it, fanning himself with his hat. I think he regretted that there was nothing more for him to do. Finally, he got up and brushed himself off, and we stood there together with our miserable clothes all damp and our hands all dirty from the work, and the first crickets rasping and the flies really beginning to bother, and the birds crying out the way they do when they're about to settle for the night. And my father bowed his head and began to pray, remembering his father to the Lord, and also asking the Lord's pardon and his father's as well. I, must, I missed my grandfather mightily, and I felt the need of pardon too. But that was a very long prayer. Every prayer seemed long to me at that age, and I was truly bone-tired. I tried to keep my eyes closed, but after a while I had to look around a little. And this is something I remember very well. At first I thought I saw the sun setting in the east. I knew where east was because the sun was just over the horizon when we got there that morning. Then I realized that what I saw was a full moon rising just as the sun was going down. Each of them was standing on its edge with the most wonderful light between them. It seemed as if you could touch it, as if there were palpable currents of light passing back and forth, or as if there were great taut skeins of light suspended between them. I wanted my father to see it, but I knew I'd have to startle him out of his prayer, and I wanted to do it the best way, so I took his hand and kissed it. And then I said, look at the moon. And he did. He just stood there until the sun was down and the moon was up. They seemed to float on the horizon for quite a long time, I suppose because they were both so bright you couldn't get a clear look at them. And that grave and my father and I were exactly between them, which seemed amazing to me at the time because I hadn't given much thought to the nature of the horizon. My father said, I would never have thought this place could be beautiful. I'm glad to know that. <clears throat> Once my father, my grandfather took me to Des Moines on the train to see Bud Fowler play. He was with Keokuk for a season or two. The old man fixed me with that eye of his, and he told me there was not a man on this round earth who could outrun or outthrow Bud Fowler. I was pretty excited. But nothing happened in that game, or so I thought then. No runs, no hits, no errors. In the, in the fifth inning, a thunderstorm that had been lying along the horizon the whole afternoon just sort of sauntered over and put a stop to it all. I remember the groan that went up from the crowd when the heavy rain began. I was only about 10 years old, and I was relieved, but it was a terrible frustration for, to my grandfather. One more terrible frustration for the poor old devil. I say this with all respect. Even my father called him that, and my mother. 
He had lost that eye in the war, and he was a pretty wild, he was pretty wild looking generally, but he was a fine preacher in the style of his generation, so my father said. That day he had brought a little bag of licorice, which really did surprise me. Whenever he put his fingers into it, it rattled with the trembling of his hand, and the sound of, um, <clears throat> was just like the sound of fire. I noticed this at the time, and it seemed natural to me. I also more or less assumed that the thunder and the lightning that day were creation tipping its hat to him, as if to say, glad to see you here in the stands, Reverend. Or maybe it said, why, Reverend, what in this grieving world are you doing here at a sporting event? My mother said once that he attracted terrible friendship, using terrible in the old sense, of course, and meaning only respect. When he was young, he was an acquaintance of John Brown and of Jim Lane, too. I wish I could tell you more about that. There was a kind of truce in our household that discouraged talk about the old times in Kansas and about the war. It was not long after the trip to Des Moines that we lost him, or he lost himself. In any case, a few weeks later, he took off for Kansas. I read somewhere that a thing that does not exist in relation to anything else cannot itself be said to exist. I can't quite see the meaning of a statement so purely hypothetical as this, though I may simply lack understanding. But it does remind me of that afternoon when nothing flew through the air, no one slid or drifted or tagged, when there was no waltz at all, so to speak. It seems to me that the storm had to put an end to it, as if it were a fire to be put out, an eruption into this world of an alarming kind of nullity. There was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. It seems to me a little like that as I remember it, though it went on a good deal longer than half an hour. No, that word has real power. My grandfather had nowhere to spend his courage, no way to feel it in himself. That was a great pity. As I write, I am aware that my memory has made much of very little. There was that old man, my grandfather, sitting beside me in his ashy coat, trembling just because he did, sharing out the frugal pleasures of his licorice, maybe with Kansas somehow transforming itself from memory to intention in his mind that very afternoon. Bud Fowler stood at second base with his glove on his hip and watched the catcher. I know he liked to play barehanded, but that is what I remember, and it's all I ever could remember about him, so there's no point trying to put the memory right. I followed his career in the newspaper for years, until they started up the Negro Leagues. Then I sort of lost track of him. When my father and I were walking along the road in the quiet in the moonlight, away from the graveyard where we'd found the old man, my father said, you know, everybody in Kansas saw the same thing we saw. At the time, I took him to mean the entire state was a witness to our miracle. I thought that whole state could vouch for the particular blessing my father had brought down by praying there at his father's grave, or the glory that my grandfather some, had somehow emanated out of his parched repose. Later, I realized my, mother would, uh, my father would have meant that the sun and moon aligned themselves as they did with no special reference to the two of us. He never encouraged any talk about visions or miracles except the ones in the Bible. I can't tell you, though, how I felt walking along beside him that night, along that rutted road, through that empty world. What a st sweet strength I felt in him and in myself and all around us. I'm glad I didn't understand, because I've rarely felt joy like that, an assurance. It was like one of those dreams where you're filled with some extravagant feeling you might never have in life. It doesn't matter what it is, even guilt or dread, and you learn from it what an amazing instrument you are, so to speak, what a power you have to experience beyond anything you might ever actually need. Who would have thought that the moon could dazzle and flame like that? Despite what he said, I could see that my father was a little shaken. He had to, st he had to stop and wipe his eyes. My grandfather told me once about a vision he'd had when he was still living in Maine, not yet 16. He had fallen asleep by the fire, worn out from a day helping his father pull stumps. Someone touched him on the shoulder, and when he looked up, there was the Lord holding out his arms to him, which were bound in chains. My grandfather said those irons had rankled right down to his bones. 
He told me that as the saddest fact and eyed me with the one seraph eye he had, the old grief fresh in it. He said he knew then that he had to come to Kansas and make himself useful to the cause of abolition. To be useful was the best thing the old men ever hoped for themselves, and to be aimless was their worst fear. I have a lot of respect for that view. When I spoke to my father about the vision he had described to me, my father just nodded and said, it was the times. He himself never claimed any such experience, and he seemed to want to assure me I need not fear that the Lord would come to me with his sorrows. And I took comfort in the assurance. That is a remarkable thing to consider. My grandfather seemed to me stricken and afflicted, and indeed he was, like a man everlastingly struck by lightning, so that there was an ashiness about his clothes and his hair never settled, and his eye had a look of tragic alarm when he wasn't actually sleeping. He was the most unreposeful human being I ever knew, except for certain of his friends. All of them could sit on their heels into their old age, and they'd do it by preference, as if they had a grudge against furniture. They had no flesh on them at all. They were like the Hebrew prophets in some unwilling retirement, or like the primitive church still waiting to judge the angels. There was one old fellow whose blessing and baptizing hand had a twist burned into it because he had taken hold of a young jayhawker's gun by the barrel. They had been to Lane and Oberlin, and they knew their Hebrew and their Greek and their Locke and, and their Milton. Some of them even set up a nice little college in Tabor. It lasted quite a while. The people who graduated from it, especially the young women, would go by themselves to the other side of the earth as teachers and missionaries and come back decades later to tell us about Turkey and Korea. Still, they were bodacious old men, a lot of them. It was the most natural thing in the world that my grandfather's grave would look like a place where someone had tried to smother a fire. There have been heroes here, and saints and martyrs, and I want you to know that, because that is the truth, even if no one remembers it. To look at the place, it's just a cluster of houses strung along a few roads, and a little row of brick buildings with stores in them, and a grain elevator, and a water tower with Gilead written on its side, and the post office, and the schools, and the playing fields, and the old train station, which is pretty well gone to weeds now. Those saints got old and the times changed and they just seemed like eccentrics and nuisances and no one wanted to listen to their fearsome old sermons or hear their wild old stories. I say it to my shame. It got so I didn't really like to be with my grandfather and that's the truth. It wasn't just the shabbiness and it wasn't just that whenever some useful object turned up missing, the owner happened by our house to mention the fact. The eye, that eye of his always seemed to me to be full of expectation and disappointment both at once, and I began to dread the moments when it would fall on me. The old men called people who failed to embrace the great cause dough faces. There's a lot of contempt in that phrase. They were harsh in their judgments, with reason, I believe. It has seemed to me sometimes as though the Lord breathes on this poor gray ember of creation and it turns to radiance for a moment or a year or the span of a life and then it sinks back into itself again and to look at it no one would know it had anything to do with fire or light. That is what I said in my Pentecost sermon. I've reflected on that sermon and there is some truth in it but the Lord is more constant and far more extravagant than it seems to imply. Whenever you turn your eyes, the world can shine like, can, like transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to it except a little willingness to see. Only who could have the courage to see it? Theologians talk about a prevenient grace that precedes grace itself and allows us to accept it. I think there must also be a prevenient courage that allows us to be brave. That is, to acknowledge that there is more beauty than our eyes can bear that precious things have been put into our hands and to do, nothing, to do nothing to honor them is to do great harm. And therefore, this courage allows us, as the old men said, to make ourselves useful. It allows us to be generous, which is another way of saying exactly the same thing. But that is the pulpit speaking. What have I to leave you but the ruins of old courage and the lore of old gallantry and hope? 
Well, as I've said, it is all an ember now, and the good Lord will surely someday breathe it into flame again. I love the prairie. So often I have seen the dawn come and the light flood over the land and everything turn radiant at once, that word good so profoundly affirmed in my soul that I am amazed I should be allowed to witness such a thing. There may have been a more wonderful first moment when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. But for all I know, to the contrary, they still do sing and shout, and they certainly might well. Here on the prairie, there is nothing to distract attention from the evening and the morning, nothing on the horizon to, uh, <clears throat> to abbreviate or to delay. Mountains would seem an impertinence from that point of view. To me, it seems rather Christ-like to be as unadorned as this place is, as little regarded. I can't help imagining that you will leave sooner or later, and it's fine if, you do, if you've done that or you mean to do it. This whole town does look like whatever hope becomes after it begins to weary a little, then weary a little more. But hope deferred is still hope. I love this town. I think sometimes of going into the ground here as a last wild gesture of love. I too will smolder away the time until the great and general incandescence. I'll pray that you grow up a brave man in a brave country. I will pray you find a way to be useful. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. Thank you. Thank you.